Oh, thank you, thank you. Good morning, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you for the sweet text messages. Oh, I just love you guys. Thank you so much. Hi, Larie. How are you? And Larie, I need to call you because I need to get some of your soaps. I keep saying I want to do that. And I haven't really been on Facebook because I've been trying to manage my time a little better. But, um, good afternoon, Sasha. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Oh, thank you, Letitia. This is the best community. Hello, good afternoon, Karen. You have some cured finally. Excellent, excellent. So, um, if you get a chance, Larie, shoot me some pictures. Let me know what you have available, and I'll, um, I'll buy some soaps from you. Good morning, Aisha. Good morning. Oh, is that Alejandra? Good morning, Alejandra. All right, guys. Well, it is noon, so we're going to pray. And hi, Tanya. We're going to pray and get started so that we can cover all of what we have left. We are pretty much done with, with um, lesson one after our meeting today, and we're ready to move into lesson two. I'm very excited, so let us have a word of prayer. Lord, we are so thankful for this opportunity that you have given us to meet together. We are just tremendously thankful for what you are doing throughout this community. Lord, we feel the the love and the support and the changes that are being made, the understanding that is being gained, and we just praise you and we thank you. And we ask that you would be with us even now as we take time to summarize what we have discuss this week. May it take root in our hearts, Lord, that our entire lives may be changed, that we will be Christians at home first, missionaries at home, and that our influence will be spread abroad, and that because you have been lifted up in our lives, many will be drawn unto you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in our lesson book this week. So we spent several weeks, maybe almost six weeks, in reading thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, laying the foundation of who Christ was as a teacher, how he taught, how he laid out principles, and now we are coming to the end of his Sermon on the Mount, which is what Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing covers, and we come to a parable that likens a wise man and a foolish man. And the wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And so we're in our lesson on page 11. And it says, Jesus ended his sermon on the mount with a parable showing the result of building right character or wrong character. And so we see here that these houses that were built are representative of character. So we can build our character on the rock or we can build our character on the sand. Good afternoon, Lisa. And we looked at verse 724, Matthew 724, which says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him. Unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So who is the wise man? The wise man is the person who hears the sayings of Christ. And then through the power of Christ, as well as through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is able to do these things. Good afternoon, um, Sandy. So we um, will move on. So we filled out some definitions and we moved on and we... Here, I'm going to take this page out so I can 
turn this way. I've got my big binder sitting here on the table. Okay. Then it talks about uh, the rock. Character is the house being built. And then on the right-hand side of page 12, it says, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And we talk about the winds and the floods. These are the trials of life. And notice that the trials of life, the winds and the floods, beat on both the house that was built on the sand and the house that was built on the rock. So the same problems came, the same issues came. There was nothing different. The only difference was the foundation on which the house was built, which we have seen is the character. So what does that mean? How we respond to the trials and the tribulations that come in our life will be determined by our character, okay? And so that hits home because as parents, as moms, as dads, so the, the children are, are going to misbehave. That, that's what children do. But how we respond to the children will be based on our characters. And prayerfully, as we learn to rear, rear them in the ways of Christ, the children won't misbehave, right? But even Ellen White talks in Child Guidance and Adventist Home of how her children would ask her to do things. Mommy, can we go to this party on the Sabbath? No, <laughs> right? And so they... So it's not that the children didn't ask, but how she dealt with them was different because she had learned the ways of Christ. We shouldn't misbehave if they are. Amen, Tanya. So just because they're misbehaving doesn't mean, mean we have to misbehave. Thank you for saying that. And so we're learning a different way. And as we learn a different way, we are teaching them that different way, that new way that they too might walk in that path, but we have to show them that it's a path worth worth walking in. And I just thought about this this week as I was meditating on these things that we were talking about. It's so many youth are leaving the church, especially around their college age. I say between the ages of 18, 25, 30, they're leaving the church. Why? Because mom and dad's religion is not one that they want. Have mercy. And so we want to have a religion an experience that that our children want and, and that they want the relationship that we have uh, because of the peace that it brings and because of the relationship that we are having with them and with others. And so if, we, if we're not a Christian at home, though, then they're, they're not going to care about what we're doing at church, how many offices we hold, because we need to learn how to be loving at home. Amen. Okay. And then we go on to see that it talks about the sand. And we learn some scientific information about sand. Sand comes from rocks, mostly. Um, I imagine that a lot of the sand that we have came from the flood, right? Because there was a lot of water and things being thrown around. Amen to that. Authentic authenticity is attracted. Amen authenticity is what did the children say let's keep it real because and you know what I've, I've been thinking another thought that I've been having is with this generation we look at them and we just think wow is Jesus ever going to come back like are we ever going to get it right but the beauty of this generation is that they do not fake it they they don't fake it right and what we see may not be what we want to see but they are being who they are and they're not pretending to be someone that they're not. And so when they are born again, when they do have that experience with Christ, we will know that it's real. And so for me, that is very encouraging. Um, not that they're not faking it and doing whatever they're doing, but that they, they are being authentic and that when Christ changes them, we will see Christ in an authentic way, right? It, it won't be the, the fake church members or, you know, whatever. And maybe we've been a fake church member, right? But the point is, it, it will be real. We will know it's real. The world will know it's real. And that's when the shaking will really come. That's when the persecution will really begin because that primitive godless as has not been experienced since apostolic times will be real in this day and age. We must be as a little child genuine to amen to enter the kingdom of heaven amen amen 
And that reminds me, guys, I need to turn on this thing to save the chat. All right, excellent. Okay. Um, so let's move on to... Before we move on to obedience to principles, I wanted to bring out this point that, and I think we brought it out on the line this morning in maybe a couple days, not this morning, yesterday, one of these days. Maybe it was this morning during the prayer call that we talked about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. So, Bible study note, and I wrote this in my little book that I probably should go get where I wrote my notes, but... One thing that you want to do when you're studying, not only this material, but your Bible. So you're linking thoughts, right? So in this lesson, we're talking about the wise man and the foolish man. But there we have those terms, wise, foolish. Who else was wise, foolish? The 10 versions. So let me read to you this quote, which ties it all together. This is from Christ's Object Lessons, page four. 11 paragraph one the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites they have a regard for the truth they have advocated the truth they are attracted to those who believe the truth but they have not yielded themselves to the holy spirit's working they have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their own nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The spirit works upon, this is page 411 in paragraph one. The spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Okay, so how to look and live, what does that take your mind back to? In the wilderness with Moses and the serpents. And God tells Moses to put this serpent on the pole, look and live. Okay, so I'm just showing you guys, like this is this is how your Bible study is going to go. So you're reading, you're like, oh, wait a minute, oh, oh. Wait a minute, there's another thought. Okay, so we're not gonna go there because we gotta stay. Hi, how are you? Is that Sister Sida? Their service to God degenerates into a form. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. Ezekiel 33, 31. The Apostle Paul points out that this will be the special characteristic of those who live just before Christ's coming. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So I just wanted to read that so you can see the direct correlation of the, the wise man, foolish man, wise virgin, foolish virgin. It's talking about the same class of people. It's no different. And then she even goes on further to say that the parable about the, the just ground, the stony ground here is the same class of people. Built on the sand, stony ground here is, Foolish virgins, it's all the same class of people, okay? So I just wanted to share that because when we're, so we're learning how to study, we're learning how to line upon line, precept upon precept, we want to be listening for these key words, we want to be listening for these descriptions so that we 
can go in our mind to something else that we've heard. And as we commune with God, as we allow God to, to open up our minds, then he's going to bring the other scripture that you never even knew related to this one. He's, he's going to bring it together. And even if you don't know how to do it, if you read the writings of Ellen White long enough, she does it for you. And then you're going to be like, what? How did she get that? And then you just, if you just read, if you just go back and read what she read and ask God to show you, he will show you how she got. Because I used to read her stuff and be like, now where did she get that from? But if, as you keep reading, then she'll be over here in one verse talking about another verse. Was Judas of this class? Absolutely. So Judas... And we read that. Was Sandy, was it you that read about Judas? About how he, Judas loved God. Um, and he, he never thought that he would betray Christ. Like Judas was not a hypocrite. We read it this week. So we'll, um, if somebody has the reference for that, please put it up. But in fact, when I think it was Sandy who read it, when Sandy read it, like literally chills went down my spine because I think the point that Sandy was making was that, you know, we look at Judas and Judas is like the betrayer and no Christian would ever classify themselves as Judas. Like who, no one would name their child Judas. Like you would not be a Christian to name, like no one would associate themselves with Judas. But when she read how Ellen White speaks of Judas, I mean, that thing just comes a little close <laughs> for my liking. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever been reading the prophet and you just have to put the book down. It's just like, this is a little too much for me, right? I mean, it just, that thing hit home. It was such an eye opener. You're just like, wait a minute. I thought Judas was like the heathen. Mm -mm. Judas was not a heathen. Judas was a church member. He was the treasurer, y'all. Judas was a tithe paying church member. Now he was stealing. But this was a in regular standing church member. That's who Judas was. Like he was not, he was, he showed up for class. <laughs> he was there. No, he, he wasn't missing. Like people weren't having to go visit him. He was at the dinner table. <laughs> like Judas, yeah, <laughs> Judas was a, he was a regular church member, y'all. So we, okay. And he loved Jesus. Have mercy, have mercy. Like, yeah, I can't even take it all in. Hello, how are you? I just... Anyway, okay, so we're going to have to go back and talk about Judas because li it literally sent chills up my spine because I was like, whoa, like I was reading and I was like, wow, like this could describe any one of us, um, you know, and we not even know it, right? Whew, okay, it's making my blood pressure go up, okay? All right, so anyway, to answer the question, this, this not only does it describe Judas, it brings to mind how we could be Judas and not even know it until it's too late. That's the scary part, right? So the foolish virgins, like they didn't even know they were foolish. Like they, they were not faking it. They, they loved the truth. They wanted to be right with God, but they just did not allow him to do the necessary work. They wanted to get it done, but, but they just did not cooperate with God to, to get the, the work done as it needed to be. And so that is, that's very scary. Okay, so let us read, um, let us read here. I'm on page 15. So how do we avoid being the Judas by beholding Christ, but he beheld Christ in person? Okay, so, so I, I think the answer to that question is one, Surrender, surrender. We, we must learn to surrender totally and we must, so here's the thing. We have to be willing to be made willing. God will show us where our defects of character are, okay? And first, we cannot make excuses, okay? And as somebody brought this up on the line one day this week, um, and the, the picture that, and I know, I'm probably not quoting them right, but the picture that I got in my mind is, you know, we're doing right until Sister Pew crosses me at church. Okay, I'm using myself, right? So I'm coming to church, 
I'm fine. Here comes Sister Pew having a bad attitude. I was minding my own business. And so now I go off on Sister Pew. I, I lose it. And then I blame Sister Pew that I lost it. And I'm, I'm okay, right? And even if I feel like what I did was wrong, I only did wrong because of the way Sister Pew came at me, okay? So now I have partially accepted my blame, but I have partially put the blame on someone else feeling at least partially justified in what I did. And so where do we see that? In the Garden of Eden. So here comes God to Adam and to Eve. He questions them. And what do both of them do? Cast the blame elsewhere. This is, this is what the heart unrenewed does. And so that is a prime factor what's the word i'm looking for that that is for sure we can know that we are not allowing god to work in us because we're not able to take the blame of of what we have done when when we have failed god okay and so we can know that we are not in a re in a right relationship with God according to how we respond to people who cut across our character. Hold on just a second. All right. So I hope that answers your question. So God in his mercy <coughs> allows the rains to come, the trials to come, the winds to come that we may see how we respond when they come, the Lord shows us our character and then we have to be with. Amen. He shows us where our defects are. And then we have to be willing to allow him to work those things out of our character. So have you ever prayed for patience? And then everywhere you go, you have to wait. Like, has that ever happened to you? Oh, Lord, Lord, please help me to be my patient. So you're thinking that you're praying what you really think in your mind is that you're praying for God to make you just not feel impatient. Which he will do, but you have to allow him to work that out. Aisha, has that happened to you? So, oh Lord, Lord, I need more patience. Lord, and you're on your knees and you are begging the Lord and you are so serious. And then you go to the grocery store and it's 15 people in the line. Or it's two people in the line. It's 15 people in the other line and you're all excited because you got in line with two people or it's only one person. But then you have to wait. And then the 15 people have gone on about their business and checked out. And you're waiting because the one person in front. Has that happened to y'all? <laughs> you're just like, what in the world? Like, I came to this line because I'm trying to get out this door. Right? And so the point is, now God has put you in that line. He did it on purpose, y'all. He put you in that line because he wants you to wait and he wants you to not complain that you have to wait so now he's giving you opportunities to you could be impatient or you can say oh yeah lord i did pray to you this morning to ask me okay lord so now why am i in this line waiting so like you could ask him that right and he may he may just he may not even tell you he just may just say okay just just wait right but the point is, you're going to pray for it, and then he's going to give you opportunities to show that you have mastered the lesson. Okay, so Judas wasn't willing to allow change, but he desired the change. Yes, yes. And if you read in Ellen White, if I'm not mistaken, she talks about the way she says it. I'm trying to remember the words. Judas did. Judas never meant to betray Christ. So... He thought that he was going to have the people come get Christ and then Christ was going to use his power and then he was going to escape. So when Christ didn't escape, like Judas was like, whoa, like he, he was so defeated because he, his plan did not go 
according to the way that he meant it to go. I hope I'm explaining this well. So Judas, Judas loved Christ and he wanted to be like Christ. Like he loved Christ as a teacher. He loved the way he explained things. Like he loved Christ as a person. He genuinely loved who Christ was. And he wanted to be like that, right? But he also wanted power and he wanted a place in the government and he wanted to be in a position of prestige. And so he did not allow Christ to work in him the necessary change that he might be like him. Judas reasoned that if Jesus was to be crucified, the event must come to pass. His own act and betraying the Savior would not change the result. If Jesus was not to die, it would only force him to deliver himself. Okay? So, and let me go back here. Let's see if I miss anything. Right. Okay? So, I hope that answers the question of if Judas had allowed Christ to do and 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 here's the interesting thing because you also see some of judas in peter right because christ is talking to peter and peter's like lord i will die for you lord i will do anything you know peter's saying all the things he would do for the lord and the lord's like really really peter is that what you would do so peter not only would you not die for me before the cock crows you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, I would never do that. So Christ is trying to tell Peter what he's going to do. And Peter's like, uh -uh. no, like, I don't know what you're thinking. So what we have to learn to do is in our time with God, he's going to show us who we are, what we would do, or even in the situation that he gives us, we're going to reveal who we are. So we're going back to the situation with the sister at church. We were minding my own business. Here she comes, right? Okay. And now I've lost it. Right. You lost it because Christ was not in control. Okay. And so now instead of making excuses because she was out of control, and she probably was, but that has nothing to do with why I was out of control, right? Okay, and so once we now acknowledge that I was out of control, that I was not under the control of the Holy Spirit, now we're in a position for Christ to do some work. Okay, but as long as I make an excuse for how someone else behaved, well, I only did this because that, no, no. Okay, does that make sense? I hope that answers the question. Because self was reigning. And so self cannot be on the throne of our heart, period. We, we must allow God to dethrone self. The issue for both Peter and Judas was that they did not really know Christ, and this is life eternal, that they may know me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Amen. He held on to one sin and it ruined him. So scary. Amen. So scary. Our plant-based kitchen is that Stacy or is that someone else all right okay guys so you can see how scary this thing is because like I said we've looked at Judas and you know I just don't know that I've ever even compared myself to Judas because Judas is just far removed from who I would ever be but when you read about him in the spirit of prophecy like like I have been Judas right and so that that is just very scary to think that I have been Judas. Like that is that is that is a bone chilling thought to me. Okay. Um we studied this very story in the family Bible lessons this week and my kids are so impressed as your story. Oh hi kids. All right. The Sermon on the Mount is a picture of what constitutes true character development. Jesus invites all to be wise and build right characters instead of choosing self and foolishness which will be swept away forever so i think that is a good summary of what we have just read okay so now we're going to go on to 
um, page 16, this is the bottom. It says, in the world system, academic achievement is the focal point, not character. The thing that is emphasized is what you can get instead of what you can give. So two very important keys in this paragraph. What separates true education from worldly education or false education is the focal point. Do we want our children to make good grades? Of course we do. But that is not the, the main thing. And the truth of the matter is, if we focus on character, if we focus on developing the, the manners, which we'll talk about in just a moment, if we focus on having them be well-rounded, having them understand the mind of Christ and allowing Christ's mind to be in them, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, the good grades will come because if you are disciplined, if you are focused, if if you are studying true education, you you can't help but learn a lot of stuff, right? So how did Jesus know of stuff that he knew? Because he was well balanced, because he was well disciplined. And so if your character is formed aright, then the grades and those things will follow naturally because they, but you could make great grades and have a horrible character. You know, you, you could have a, a straight A 4.0 GPA and, and be deceitful and lazy and, um, and all kinds of things. And maybe you're not necessarily lazy in the sense of getting your work done, but maybe your house is a mess. Maybe you don't clean your room. Um, you're, you're not well balanced because you're focused on, academics above everything else character is made equivalent to good grades while it should be reversed exactly okay all right so let's go to <clears throat> education reform i'm gonna skip over because this is really just kind of an extended thought of true education versus false education and why do we need this? Why do we need this education reform? Because we have been taught the ways of Egypt. We have been taught the ways of Babylon. We have been taught the ways of Socrates and Plato. And you see these things in, in the current school system. And so these ways are actually contrary to the ways of God. And there are some things in them that you might find in true education. Like they're not just, you know, absolutely contrary, right? Because that's what deception is. It's, it's not, so the devil never just tells you a straight up lie. It's got some truth in it, okay? So if you go the world's way, you know, it's not all bad, but it's, it's not godly and it's not gonna lead you to the end result which is to, to fit your character for heaven. And so certainly your children are gonna learn things. If you do things the world's way, um, they may even be nice to people, right? And so we're, we're not saying that it's just all bad, but it's not the way of God. And so we wanna do things the way that God has intended us to do them. Um, and our main goal of true education should be that our characters are formed the right what about things such as classical education so i do not recommend classical education because the basis of classical education is antithetical to christianity so so what they will tell you is that they're merging both but you can't really merge both in, in the way that it's outlined, right? So you you can't use Shakespeare and glorify God. It, it's not possible. It just, you can't read Romeo and Juliet and and glorify God. Like it's just, it's not, they, they don't go together. And so the fundamental idea of classical conversations and the classical education it's built on the classics, right? It's built on Shakespeare 
and um, what are the other classics? The you know just what we would know. To, I can't even think of them right now. But it's built on the idea that if you take this great literature, that you can teach your children to be geniuses. But our great literature is the Bible because I don't know of any literature that they um, encourage that's actually true, right? So, right, why are we letting infidels teach our children? And so I know some great people who do classical conversations, um, but I, I would not, I would not recommend it because the, um, they focus on debate, right? Because you need to debate your faith. You need to debate your Christianity. No, no, no. Debate is not the word I would use. So we, no, we don't, we don't learn to debate. We learn the truth and then we share the truth. But I used to debate when I, when I first became an Adventist. And I debated because that's the spirit that it came in under that whole that whole debate. But it's not it's not of God. And um, yeah, I don't I don't really know how to how to say it other than that. We where I live, the classical conversation is is like if you're not in classical conversations, then you're not really a homeschooler <laughs> because this whole city is probably I would dare say that ninety percent of the people that homeschool in this city use classical conversation it may be higher than that i mean the whole homeschool when i lived in texas it was just a small percentage just a few people did but here like everybody i meet does classical conversations um and so we're not so heavily into the group here because you know they they have a totally different way that they homeschool but yeah i, I wouldn't be able to um to, to recommend that okay the jane austen series i'm not familiar with Jane Austen, I, I want to say that I've heard that before, but I'm not, um, I don't have enough familiarity with that to, right, what communion has light with darkness. And so we, we want to stay away from things that are highly based on fiction and highly, where the Bible's just the book in. If the Bible's just the book in, so we study the Bible, but we just kind of have Bible class and then everything else is based on something else then we we don't want to do that what about language arts and math what do you mean so even with language arts and math um we we can use the bible we can use not only that but the classics are not based on truth exactly they're based on fiction so we we don't want to have our homeschool based on fiction we want it to be based on the truth we want it to be based on um the Bible. Does that mean we only read the Bible? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that we won't be reading um, what we're told are, are the great classics. And we don't want to encourage a foundation of security and fiction. Amen. We want our um, foundation to be in the Bible. We are studying Antarctica and just read an excerpt from Shackleton's journey by his entries. God is referenced several times. Amen. Amen. I'll have to look that up. Okay, guys. Um, in, okay, so let's go to incentive motivation. The world's chief incentive is competition and rivalry. The Bible condemns rivalry or competition as motivation for Christians. And we, we touched on this. And so I think the, the basic concept of this is that, um, and we'll get into this later, I forget which chapter is in, but even when your children are doing chores, so like I don't pay my children to do chores. Um, I, I don't recommend that you pay your children to do chores unless it's something that they like normally don't do, right? So if it's something above and beyond what they do weekly, then you know you could pay them for that or you could um, reward them for that. So. Um, but we don't want the incentive to be the reward. So they do well, and then we might reward them, but we don't want them to do well because they're going to get a reward. Does that make sense? So I'm not saying you should never reward your children, but they should not be doing things 
because they're going to get a reward. They should do it because it needs to be done, right? So you slept in your bed, you should make it. Like, I don't, I'm not going to pay you to make your bed. No, you, you slept in it, then you need to make it. Commission, not allowance, right? So this is not, um, I'm, I'm not paying you to clean the bathroom that you use. No, you use it, so you need to clean it. I'm not paying you to wash the dishes. And so you ate here, so you need to wash the dishes. So this is this is a part of life. So you you live and you clean up. This is part of life. So I'm not I'm not paying you. Like no one pays me. So maybe to wash the car, I might pay you to do that. Okay? Maybe there's some extra stuff in the yard that's not usually there and I want some things. Maybe something broke and you fix it. Okay, but you should be willing to fix it if you know how to fix it without me paying you. But you fixed it. You did a great job. You know, I might take you out and buy you a treat or give you something nice for that. But you shouldn't be expecting that um, you're going to get paid because you you do this. So, all right. And then, and Ruth was a part of our group. I don't know if you mind me mentioning this. Ruth's daughter does her hair. Um, and she does a great job. And so, and like my little cut, my little niece is i think she's eight or nine like she can twist and braid and so you know those, those are things outside you can bake bread and and sell cookies so you want to do things that you can can do as a business but william is not your business i think that's a a good way to say it all right um okay and right down here it says but such an education is not acquired by the study of a heathen classics. Okay, so there we go for the classical education. All right, at the bottom of page 22, by such means, even the teaching of biblical literature as a school study is rendered distasteful and along with uninspired teaching as to the aversion of students for the scriptures, what are we doing to our prospective ministers and teachers? So this is basically saying that how we teach things, how we run our school, will determine how our children love the Bible. So I actually got several messages this week about older children who who don't like reading the Bible or they don't like reading some of the deeper books. Um, I don't know, about five or six messages I got this week. So one thing you want to check is what kind of things are you reading in your leisure time? What kind of things are you watching on TV? Are you playing video games? What kinds of things are you doing with your mind? Because there's certain things that if you do these things, then now when you come to the Bible, so your mind has been excited by all these artificial things. So now when you come to the Bible that's real, the mind's not excited. It's like when you eat junk food, okay? So you eat junk food, you're doping up on sugar, you're doping up on all this artificial stuff. So then you eat a salad, and that salad is not good. Why? Because it's real food. Has that ever happened to you? You eat all this junk and then you eat something real and it just, it's, it's not, it doesn't taste good. And the opposite is true. So when I first started becoming plant-based, I used to eat the McDonald's fish sandwich with cheese, okay? And French fries and a Sprite. Like that was my, that was my travel meal. Wherever we were going, we stopped at McDonald's and I would get a fish filet meal with a Sprite. And so as I started changing my diet, that's what we discovered reading The Little Friends and Primary Treasures, right? So you, lead, you, you read The Little Friends and The Primary Treasures and then you read other stuff. And because it's been so watered down, when you read something real, there's no interest, okay? And I actually spoke with one of the ladies, I think it was the Grace Link, when they, I don't know if you guys remember, so it used to be that you would read the lesson and then you would come to church and then you would discuss the lesson. But then they changed it. So now you go to church and the lesson is presented and then you don't study the lesson again. And she told me that the reason they did this is when the visitors come or the children who come who don't study, they don't want them to feel left out. They don't want them to feel like they don't know anything. And so they changed it for, for visitors or for children who don't study and i was just really devastated when i heard that because 
Like, how does that help our children to to be great in spiritual things? Um, Yolanda, when we talk about balance, how does come into play concerning true education, explaining the limited process? What do we get rid of, TV or no TV? So, let me answer that question like this, Nikki, because I, I don't I don't want to say TV or no TV or, or games or no games or because what we're teaching here is not whether or not you should be watching TV. <coughs> what we're teaching is principles of what you should or should not be watching. And probably what you will find is when you start following those principles, there's probably not a whole lot on on TV that you can watch, right? So I'm not gonna say you can't watch TV, um, but I will say there's not a lot on TV that is appropriate for those professing godliness and, and preparing for the second coming. I'll say it like that. And so, you know, um, what should we be doing? Exactly. So we, we wanna be focusing on on what we should be doing. And then if you have time to watch a documentary on Netflix, okay, right? You have time to watch a nature show or you have time to watch something that is uplifting and appropriate, then then I wouldn't say that you you couldn't do that. But the, the sitcoms, the anything that's the popular sitcoms that people are talking about on, on Facebook, then I would say absolutely we should not be watching those things. Um, and I was gonna call some, but I don't even know. Listen, there's a new show that's really popular. What's the name of that show? I don't know, my Facebook friends talk about it, but I haven't been on Facebook in a minute, so I can't remember the name of it. But there's a new show out that's like really popular. It has a black family in it, or a black man, and like all the black people are talking about this man and how it, it I guess it's supposed to accurately portray um, the, the life of a black family. I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, the, the point is it's more about the, the, the content, um, and the, right. Focus on what you focus on what you can do. Blackish. It's not blackish. That was one of them, but there's a, there's a new show. I think it's more like a drama. Anyway, I can't think of the name of it. But the, the point is, um, when we focus on, as Tanya just said, what we should, this is us. That's the name of it. That's the name of it. That is the name of it. Thank you. This is us. So when you focus more on what we should be doing with our time, getting our schedules in order, going to bed on time, getting up early in the morning, spending time with God, being focused on service. Um, okay, I don't know what that is. Okay, then you're, you're gonna find that you, not only do you not have time for a lot of these things, you don't have the desire for these things because your focus has turned, turned outward, okay? Um, Okay, guys, hold on. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, thank you. I think I don't know who that is. All right, so um, what time is it? Okay, we got about 12 minutes left. Um, on, the, on the top of page 22, it says, there is such an inspiration, such a healthy recreation combining science and the study of nature in its activities, from hiking to gardening. Such a wealth of wisdom, the wisdom of God's word, to be guarded from its use, as far outstrips the trivial and debasing reward of sports. On the other hand, there is no greater ally of the evil incentive of rivalry than the competitive sports, and this stronghold of the devil is one of the hardest to take. Now, she also, I think that once you're in the word and spending time with the Lord, he will convict you on those things that are not leading us close to him. Amen. 
And that is so true because let me tell you what happened to me. So I was a TV watcher, not even a really big TV watcher, but I did watch, um, I had a few shows that I watched, you know, like a couple times a week and you know, I, I don't know, I don't know that I would say that they were anything necessarily like bad. Right. So I would watch them and when I went to spend time with God, so I would have time with God and it would be amazing. It would be just awesome. Okay. And then I would go watch my TV. And then the next morning when it was for me, time for me to have time with God, it just, it took a long time for me to even kind of get in the zone, if you can call it that, of, of my communion with God. Like it took longer for me to bring my thoughts into focus. It took longer for me to be able to hear God speaking. And I just noticed this direct relationship between when I watched TV and, and when I didn't. And so I started to give up the TV at that point because I realized that at least for me, I cannot do both. I cannot watch my shows and laugh and have great fun and then go and spend time with God and, and it be meaningful. And so I, I had to give it up um, because I just wasn't able to, to balance them both. And so you will find that when you're spending time with God, things that you used to find funny and hilarious, they're, they're just not funny and hilarious anymore. And then you start thinking now, uh, now, why am I watching this? <laughs> like, maybe I shouldn't be watching that. Um, and and it's it's entertaining, albeit, but you when you spend time with God, you start to be entertained in a different way, right? And I think about our little leaders group that we have um, for this group. Like, we laugh all the time, but, like, we're not discussing worldly things. We're not, like, we, I think I laugh every day on that little group. I love y'all. But the point is, we, we still laugh, we still have a good time, but it's, it's not about, um, it's, it's not about worldly things. And so, you know, you, you don't have to be engaged in worldly things to, to laugh and, and have a good time. All right, um, where are we? Okay, so that talks about the recreation. So what are the, some of the things we can do for recreation? We can go bike riding, we can take a hike. Um, I'm sure that there are other things that we can do that we can find to do as a family. And so we can come away from those things that are artificial because um, like Tanya saying, it's real life and it's real people. So we're, we're doing things that are, that are real. We, we want to do things that are real as much as possible. So I think that also helps with the question about TV. Is what I'm watching real? Is it a documentary? Is it a nature show? And even then, I want to limit that because why am I watching nature on TV when I can go outside and be in nature, right? So I'm not saying we shouldn't watch nature documentaries because obviously there's things on the TV that are not going to be in your yard. But what I'm saying is we want to spend as much time in nature itself as possible as opposed to to watching those things on the television can you play sports but just not competitively um i i would say yes but you just have to watch it right because if you're just playing a game um you know for for exercise like what are you playing it for you're just playing for exercise you're just you know spending time with the family then, then I would say that's okay. But you, you have to be careful because, right, so you could play without keeping points. Um, you know, you're, you're just playing for, we did that once with my, with my, with my church, but you have to be careful because that's time you're saying, it, by nature, these things can be competitive, but it really depends on who you're playing with. If you're playing with people who are genuinely, they're just playing for exercise, they're just playing, then you can you, you can balance it. But a lot of people don't know how to just play for fun. They they want to say, oh, my team won, and oh, we beat you. And so you, you, you want to avoid that. But um, you, can, you, you can do things 
that are that are just for exercise where you're not necessarily playing to win so all right um and and even you know our churches are divided on that because you know we have um leagues of of, of sports and but um in this ministry we we do not condone that we do not support the the leagues and the competition and and things of that nature we promote exercise and recreation so how do you know it's recreation so after i come back i'm i'm rejuvenated um i i feel good so you know maybe you go kayaking or maybe kayaking or canoeing you just you do things that you could do together with the family but you're not necessarily trying to compete against anyone okay all right um and let's go oh and then hold on guys i'm getting hot i think when i talk a lot i get hot so under the nature study and occupation <coughs> we have this conversation of he says how do you find god's word in nature i go outdoors and sit in the midst of things i see but I do not get any heavenly message. How do you learn to read God's thoughts in nature? And so then it shows how we go and we we learn by observation. So you observe the birds. Like, have you ever looked at a bird nest and wonder, like, how do they build this? And I remember some, um, I think it was swallows, made a nest in our in our front door when we lived in Texas. And like my hair was in there. There was yarn in there from things I had knit. I'm like, did I drop the yarn? Like, I don't even know where they got it from. I think some of the stuff's come through the dryer. There was little pieces of the dryer. Um, whatever stuff you call it. Lint. And it was just amazing how they had taken all of these little things from my house. Um, and, and put together... A nest. I was I was absolutely amazed. But you can go into nature and just observe and learn lessons. And someone posted um, the gospel in the series, the gospel in the blade of grass, the gospel in, according to a dandelion, um, the gospel according to the trees. All right. Um, okay, guys. I think we're almost done. I have athletic talent. And I found that I could teach my boys how to play a sport so they are not ridiculed for not knowing how and be physically fit. Okay. Okay. So, now, on this part five under parent education, let me take the sheet out. It says, not only should parents be trained for marriage and parenthood, but they should especially be trained for the teaching of their children. And I'm sure that every one of us on this line would not only agree with this, but would like to have taken this course before we even had children. And like most of us in here already have children, right? So some of us, like me, children are much older. My daughter's 20. My son will be 16 next month. <laughs> and so... You know, like, I wish I had taken this class before I even got pregnant, okay? I don't even know if I would ever even had children if I had read this. I'd probably be so afraid. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you you need this information, like, before they even come. Because by the time they come, you realize you just already been messing up, right? And so, um, hold on, I was going to read something else. Did I underline it? Children should virtually be trained in a homeschool from the cradle to maturity. It is said that many parents have cast off their God-given responsibility to their children and are willing that strangers should bear it for them. And God has been using all of you to help me so much. Amen, Heidi. I am so amazed and blessed by this group because everyone brings a different aspect and i don't know god you can you all can see that god has put this group together and it has been just such a 
tremendous blessings. Okay, one last thing that I wanted to read before we go is right at the end. This is just kind of a summary for character building. Sacrificing our children to Moloch. Have mercy. A disciple or a parent is a learner or pupil in the daily school of Christ. And we really could spend just even another hour just discussing these last um, several things on page 26. But a disciple or parent is a learner or pupil in the daily school of Christ. Now, why is this important? Because the purpose of true education is that the image of Christ may be reproduced in the student, right? So in order for the parent to teach the child the ways of Christ, the parent must first know the ways of Christ. And so we must be, we can't teach what we don't know or do ourselves. So we cannot teach our children how to yield their spirit to God in the moment when they're having a fit if we do not know how to yield our spirit to God in the moment when they're having a fit. Like, do you see what I'm saying? So how I respond to my child when they are not having victory, will teach them how to or how not to have victory. So I must first learn the lesson of victory. I must learn the lesson of surrender. I must learn the lesson of self-control. And then when I learn how to have victory in the moment, how, how did I stop yelling at my children? How did I stop losing my patience? Because I learned how to surrender those thoughts to God. I learned how to allow him to empower me. And so now I can teach my children what God has taught me personally. Because that same victory that I'm experiencing is the same victory that they will experience if I teach them how to link up with Christ and experience it. Okay? A disciple develops his character by building on the rock, Christ Jesus. This rock is the word. Christ is the word. Was John 1, 1 say, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Christ is the word. So as we study the word, it will be assimilated to us as we as we eat the word you are what you eat so as we eat the word though the words of life will miraculously change the the makeup of our spiritual body okay just as physical food changes the makeup of our physical body the spiritual food will do the same thing for our for our spiritual body a disciple hears and does. The purpose of true education is to build character. A reform is needed. Okay? So what has lesson one been about? Lesson one has been about character development. The whole purpose of this journey that we're on is to teach my child to be like Jesus. That's the whole purpose of what I'm doing. So when I'm frustrated, when I've had enough, when I don't even know when I can do this, when I'm looking to see when school enrollment opens and see if I can look in my budget and afford to send my children to school, <laughs> right? Because, like, I just don't even know how I'm going to do this. The entire purpose of what we're doing is so that our children will have characters like Christ so that their names will be written in the book of life and remain there. And so that we can be a family through, throughout all of eternity. But we must first learn to be a family here so that they'll even want to be with us throughout eternity. And I, um, I think there's a quote from Ellen White that says, Parents, do not make your children believe that heaven would not be a pleasant place 
if you're going to be there. I'm going to find that quote. It says something like that. Have you guys read that? <laughs> Have mercy. Don't, don't make it seem like the children don't want to go to heaven if they think you're going to be there. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's really terrible. Have you read that? So I need to find that quote. Uh, when I read that, I was like, wow, that, that's a deep quote. And so we want our children to believe that they want to be where we are. Why? Because where we are, Jesus is. Because if Jesus is in me, then wherever I am, Jesus is, right? And so we want our children to love Jesus because the revelation that we have given them of Jesus, of God, is that he is a lovely person, that he's loving to be around, that he's, um, that it's, it's a nice thing to be around him and that they would want to be with us throughout eternity, um, not because we give them what they want or because we never get on to them, but because even when we have to get on to them, we do it in love and they know that we are only doing it because we love them um, and, be, and because these things are necessary. So, all right, guys, well, we are out of time. And um, we are officially done with lesson one on Sunday. We will begin lesson two tomorrow. Um, Brother Damian Ray will be leading out in our prayer time. So excited. If you guys have not heard Brother Damian, he is a um, awesome man of God on fire looking to lead his household after the ways of God. I enjoy his um, periscopes that he does from time to time. And so I think you guys will enjoy meeting him for those that don't know him. Um, he doesn't come on more regularly because he does work, but I'm looking forward to having him lead out for us. So that will be tomorrow morning. We will meet tomorrow morning for our 630 prayer call. And then Sunday, we will meet for our 6.30 prayer call and then for our 7 a.m. study call to begin lesson two. Oh, he does listen to the recordings. All right. We'll tell him that we love him. I'm sure he already knows that. Um, and that we are, and I'll probably send him an email sometime today. I've been meaning to email him, but this week has gotten away from me. But um, let him know we we love him and we appreciate him and we look forward to um, having him join our team, at least temporarily. Um, all right. So, guys, the Bible, the educator is the name of lesson two. Let me look at lesson two right here. Yes, the Bible, the educator, the textbook is the name of lesson two. And if you look in the, well, actually we're still on February. So the it should be in the Google Drive. And I actually uploaded the calendar for March as well. Um, and so for those who might be ahead or want to just look ahead to see what may be coming up. Um, and someone did mention how they enjoyed the fact that we had two days built in for a review and we do try to build them in periodically i don't know that there's any days built in for review in march but i do think there are some days where the reading is less intense and so you could use those days for review um if 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 necessary and don't forget if you're i know a lot of us are busy on sabbaths but um this is you know this is true education and so this is appropriate to to read on sabbath if you want to do some reading especially if you're reading you know thoughts from the mount of blessing or desire of ages um feel free to use that time to to catch up on the readings all right guys well blessings to you all a happy sabbath to you all i pray that god will be with you as you prepare for the sabbath and See you singing in a few hours. Oh, Brother Brian, I was going to try to skip that today. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm going to make it today, Brother Ryan. I have so many things going on. But um, maybe I'll try to sneak it in another day. I don't think I'm going to make the singing today because my day is just 
I know. Oh, Brother Ryan, don't do that to me. See how you guys do me. It's so terrible. I know. I know. Don't cry. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> oh. All right. Okay. Okay, guys. I'm, I'm going to try. I have so much going on. You guys have no idea. I'm going to try to get it in. And then we got Bible study at 715. Okay. Maybe we'll try to come on like just for a little bit um, to sing. Okay, guys, I'm going to try to get it in, but <laughs> y'all pray for me because I'm just my, I'm stretched thin and I'm trying to balance it all, but it's, it's a lot going on over here. And so, um, I will, I will try to get it in. Okay. All right. Now don't be too disappointed if I don't make it, but I'm going to try to make it. I'm going to try. Um, are we voting? <laughs> no, we are not voting. <laughs> um, I'm going to try. We'll try to get on. And for those of you who don't even know what we're talking about, um, on my Periscope channel that we used last year, I actually did these um, live meetings on Periscope. Sorry, this is no idea. So last year we did the Periscope. We did the live meeting was through Periscope. And so I still have my Periscope channel, which I think is Yolanda Marie 73 and so over the last few weeks, maybe three, three or four weeks, how many weeks have we done of singing? About three or four. So over the last three or four weeks, we have come on in the evening about 6.30-ish, and we sing some hymns. Um, and sometimes it's me and my daughter and my son. And then one week, one of the girls... We were having a Bible study, and one of the girls from the Bible study came, um, and she joined in. And so um, we sing on the Periscope channel for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or so. And so we had been doing that on Friday evening. So we were going we to try to get on. I actually had not planned on coming on this evening, but... Um, I will try. It probably will be a little later. Like it'll probably be like between 6.45 and 7 or even 7 and 7.15 while we're waiting for our guests to come for the Bible study tonight. It's probably when it'll be. But we will try to um, to get on to because I know many people are, are, are blessed by it and, and we're blessed by by doing it. So. All right, so to those of you who would like to join us in the singing or watch some of the singing that we've already done, you can go to Periscope. And you don't have to have Periscope to, to look it up. You can go to Periscope and you can search my name, Yolanda Marie 73. It'll bring up my channel and it'll show you all the videos that I've done. You can even watch the videos from this class from last year from the 10 principles because all of them are loaded there i think two of them are private and i couldn't figure out how to not make them private but all of the videos from last year's class are on the periscope channel as well as the videos that we've done to uh, oh yes thank you sherry because i'm getting off track don't forget to close the prayer thank you for that um so let us close out with prayer lord we are so thankful for this time that we have spent together. We praise you for this beautiful curriculum that has been put together for us to go through. We thank you for the concepts that we have already understood and put in place. We ask for your strength for those concepts that may be a little more challenging Lord, maybe they cut across our very inclination, but we know they are right. And we know they are in harmony with the principles of your word. And so we ask that you would shape us and that you would mold us, that you would forgive us for the time that we have spent not walking in your ways, not raising our children in the way that you would have them to be raised. Lord, we ask that you would help us to redeem the time that you would transform our lives first as parents and that the transformation of our lives would then work in our children, that you would save them, Lord, and in spite of the mistakes that 
we have made and we we claim the promise that if we as parents would surrender ourselves fully to you that you would devise means and ways whereby a transformation might take place in our home so we claim this promise in the precious name of jesus amen all right guys all right guys so i will see you this evening so we can sing together and i look forward to us meeting again in the morning um with brother ray leading us out all right god bless you all and have a wonderful sabbath and a blessed weekend bye bye Happy Sabbath to you, my sister. You guys are so funny. Okay, guys, I'm ending the video. I think it's gonna end the chat as well. Bye-bye.